Welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-empowerment. Future Squared brings you a double dose of innovation inspiration every week to help you and your company stay relevant in an era of rapid change and 10x your results in both your professional and personal life. Each week, I'll bring you corporate innovators, entrepreneurs, authors, keynote speakers, and thought leaders such as Steve Blank, David Allen, Brad Feld, Tim Harford, Karen Dillon, Jenny Blake, Neil Patel, Rand Fishkin, Pascal Finette, Ryan Blair, and Ash Moria, to name just a few. While every Friday, I'll bring you Fast Fix Friday, some quick digestible insights to help you end your week on a high as you head off for the weekend. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation hub school and consultancy based in Melbourne, Australia and Singapore that works with companies to help them adopt the mindset, methods and tools to navigate change and survive and thrive in an era of rapid disruption. If your organization needs help coming up with ideas, testing and turning ideas into reality, incubating teams, driving cultural change or connecting and partnering with startups, then visit www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared for episode number 181 with Jason Calacanis. Jason is a tech entrepreneur, a wildly successful angel investor, and the host of the popular weekly podcast, This Week in Startups. As a scout for top-tier Silicon Valley venture capital firm, Sequoia Capital, and later as an angel investor, Jason has invested in 150 early-stage startups, including a number of them who have achieved billion-dollar valuations so far, such as Uber, Evernote, and Tumblr. Jason's newly released book, Angel, How to Invest in Technology Startups, Thomas' advice from an angel investor who turned $100,000 into $100 million, puts readers inside the minds of successful angel investors, helping to understand how they prioritize and make the decisions that have resulted in phenomenal profits. Jason provides a step-by-step roadmap, revealing how leading investors evaluate new ventures, calculating the risks and rewards, and explains how the best startups leverage relationships with angel investors for the best results. In this episode, we go back to Jason's rough upbringing in Brooklyn, New York in the early 80s and cover a lot of ground leading up to the present day so you can expect to learn a hell of a lot of things, including one, how to pick a billion dollar founder or startup, two, how to bounce back from failure, and three, what Jason thinks of and what advice he has for corporates investing in startups. So with that, it gives me much pleasure to welcome to the show, the one and only Jason Calacanis. Welcome to the show, Jason. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. How's everything down under? Everything down under is swell. It's a Saturday morning. It's a start of spring. It's it's nice and uh, sunny today, so everything is Awesome. How about yourself? Are you joining us from San Francisco? I am in San Francisco, which compared to Sydney and Melbourne is the worst run city in the world. <sighs> we have two two fabulously run cities there that I've been to. And uh, I just happen to live in one where our, uh, our government is just completely incapable of running a secure, efficient, safe city. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what do you what do you say to that? It sounds like is, is there any recent events that come to mind, or just in general? Uh, okay. Well, I would say um, it's a um, yeah, it's just a brutal, brutally dangerous place compared to the base of tax revenue and how efficient the companies are. Yeah, it's like if you took the most efficient, um, well healed brilliant group of people and then said let's have a bunch of incompetent people run the city they live in that's san francisco yeah yeah well i mean i guess you know you can draw parallels between that and you know individuals or companies or any number of things where they may excel at one thing um in san francisco's case for example you've got the valley and technology startups and everything else but it oftentimes does come at the detriment of other things. Um, I think I was listening to uh, Larry King speak recently and he was talking about, you know, he's one of the most celebrated uh, hosts of all time and, you know, the longest running talk show in American TV history. But when he talks about his personal life, he says he's a mess and, you know, he can't even um, cook for himself. And he's had, you know, something like eight or nine marriages and remarried the same person twice only to get divorced again. So maybe there's something in that where, you know, doubling down on one thing means it may come at the detriment of other things. 
Correct. Yeah. <laughs> that happens. Anyways, we're going off on a tangent already and I haven't even asked you a single question, Jason. So um first up, let's uh just just touch on the book. I mean, you've just released Angel, How to Invest in Technology Startups. Uh timeless advice from an angel investor who turned one hundred K into one hundred million. Um obviously in the book you share your insights and rules for investing in startups and it's currently sitting inside Amazon's top twenty in a number of categories, uh including VC, investing and finance. So congratulations. Yeah, no, we are um, completely thrilled about how well this has uh, been going. It's um, The book uh, is designed to help people understand how angel investing works. It's a very opaque, uh, you know, art might be described as alchemy to some, which means it's based on some combination of <laughs> actual science and other and so, you know, it's a um, it's a mixed bag. And I, um, I think when I look at angel investing, I was putting money into my friends' companies. And I used to think about what ideas they were doing, sometimes try to figure out if I thought those ideas would be successful. And after 150 investments, I realized, oh, there is a certain pattern here that's emerged. And I started studying what worked in my portfolio and what didn't and why, and my own judgment process and started to realize, yes, there's some randomness here and there's luck here, but um, this is a huge opportunity. And the reason that uh, people haven't shared this information is because candidly, um, why would you, if you had uh, this secret alchemy, this, secret formula of how to invest in companies and 10 years later have it result in massive uh, returns, why would you share that with anybody? Exactly. And I thought to myself, wait a second, angel investing is a popularity contest and angel investing is about deal flow. Mm -hmm. It's a popularity contest because you want founders to want to come to you first and meet you and give you the opportunity to come in. It's collaborative in that most companies do about five rounds of funding before five rounds of funding before you even get the opportunity uh, to invest in that company uh, as a venture capitalist, right? The VCs typically come in after five or six rounds, and there's typically 50 to 100 people who invest before the VCs do these days in 2017 mm. it wasn't always like that it used to be the vcs would write some of the first checks and there'd be five people on the cap table not 50 or 100 so things have changed radically it's becoming more democratized there are many more companies and the cost of getting a company to uh, product market fit which means a certain group of humans find some value from using the product. That's what product market fit means. Product means the product, the tool, the device, whatever it happens to be, the service. And the market means humans. So humans use and love your product. So that amount of money has gone down by a factor of 10 or 100. So it used to be if you wanted to launch, um, let's take a really hard product category, a gadget. A gadget would be something that Sony would spend tens of millions of dollars or Apple would spend tens of millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars producing. Now you have a company like Pebble or Oculus that went on to websites like Indiegogo or Kickstarter mm -hmm. and they raised, they put in 50 or or $100,000 to make a prototype. They spent $50,000 or $100,000 promoting it and after a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar investment, they received millions of dollars in pre-orders, in some cases tens of millions, and then they received, you know, on top of that, millions of dollars in venture capital. So the whole game's changed. It's more democratized. Startups are made for smaller amounts of money, and nobody wants to share with the rest of the world how it's done. Yeah. And so I thought to myself, I've always wanted to write a book because I started as a journalist and a writer, but I never wanted to write a book unless I felt like I was the pre preeminent expert on the field or one of the top experts in the field. Because let's face it, when you've had the same experience I've had for sure, 
where some of your friends, one of your mates comes up to you and says, here's my book, please read it. And they give it to you for free. Mm -hmm. And you look at them and you go, but you're an idiot. <laughs> you, you, have no, you have no experience. You're not a successful person. And you don't say that out loud. You think it. And then you, you read the book and you're like, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. And you, I've asked people, I always ask people when they give me their book, why'd you write the book? And they say, I literally have had multiple people say this to me. Oh, I wanted to use the book to market myself as an expert in whatever the topic of the book is. Yeah. And I just thought to myself, wait a second, you're going to waste all of our fucking time on reading your book so that you can feel better about yourself and become an expert. Yeah. I tell you what, go spend five years becoming an expert on something, then write the book. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I'm I'm not just because I want to play point guard for the New York Knicks doesn't mean that I get the job. Uh, you know, like I'd have to go prove that I can be the point guard of the Knicks and be able to run a mile a certain speed and be able to put the ball in the basket and pass it really well. So I, I just think books are sacred. I think people write them because of self-publishing um, and they think just because they put a fancy cover and a clever name on it that the rest of us are going to go, oh, my God, you know, this book is brilliant. Well, if you look at the reviews of the book, you know, we're up, we're, we broke 200 reviews in the, under two months. And I think 94% of them are five star reviews. And these are not fake reviews. You can't, you can fake 10 reviews. You can't fake 200. These are reviews from people who read the book and who said, this book is really fucking good. He, Jason tells it like it is. Yeah. And the reason I gave everybody my playbook is because, again, remember I said 50 or 100 people are investing in each company. I want to create an army of loyal angel investors who say, Jason gave me so much good advice that when I find the next Uber or Thumbtack or Datastacks or Wealthfront or Robinhood or Desktop Metal, I should give Jason a call and let him get his little slice of equity on this cap table. Mm. And so I see it as a team sport. I want to lead an army of angel investors to change the world. And since the book came out, my syndicate went from 1,200 members to 2,000. 20 accredited investors a day or so have been joining the Angelist Syndicate. It is insane. So that means when we invest twenty-five or $100,000 in a deal, We'll see another 250, 500,000, in some cases, a million dollars from this army of angel investors say, you know what, if Jason's investing, yeah, I'll put in 5K, I'll put in 1K, I'll put in 10K. And so it's not a get rich quick book. It's a get rich methodically over a decade or two by doing the hard work. Yeah. Well, you've, uh, you've, Covered a lot of bases there, Jason, from alchemy to the popularity contest of accessing deal flow to Uber's cap table, lower barriers to entry, you know, the game having changed, and obviously finishing off there on talking about the book and how it is not just a business card, as is the case with so many um, quote-unquote authors these days. And, and the problem with that approach is you might fool someone into, say, thinking that you are quote-unquote expert on a topic until they open your book and start reading and you know it's just like the um, pirate metrics funnel that was made famous uh, back in the day by 500 startups you might acquire people to your book but there's not going to be much retention if your book's crap and they're not going to believe in what your message is and therefore the whole purpose of that book kind of falls by the wayside over time and um, I guess you talked about self-publishing as well and there's so much self-publishing going on now with, with Amazon and again that ties into what you were talking about you know the game has changed today you don't necessarily need to get a writing deal with a large publishing house and global distribution and all that sort of stuff. You can distribute yourself through Amazon. But what that does, it creates a lot of noise. And I guess in the startup scene, the same rules apply where ubiquitous internet access, cloud computing, everything else has just lowered the barriers to entry for so many people around the world that there are just so many more startups these days that it can be, I imagine, much harder to identify the needle in the haystack, if you will. It, it is difficult to find the great companies, which is, you know, in the book, I talk about uh, going slow in the beginning. And when you go slow in the beginning, 
um, placing $1,000 bets. If you have a net worth of a million dollars or $5 million, something in what we call here in the United States an accredited investor, where you make two or $300,000 a year, or maybe four or 500 as in a, a, a family, you know, household income. Yeah. If you were to make 10 $1,000 bets in year one, and then in year two, you get a little more experience saying, you know, I'm going to make 10 $5,000 bets. Now you've put together 10,000 in the first year, 50,000 in the second year, you got a nice little portfolio of 20 companies. And then maybe in year three, you say, I'll do another 10. But this 10, I'll do five new ones at 10K each for 50K. And then I'll do five of the 25 existing investments. I'll do those five. And uh, with those five, I'll put 100K into them because I'll have seen them grow over a year or two. Now, if you look at that cohort of 25, let's say five of them break out and you put 100K in. That means you put $500,000 into the big winners that you've seen firsthand, that you have inside information on because you're friendly with the founder. You have an unfair competitive advantage with those five. The other 20, which you have invested 1,000 in the first 10, 5,000 in the next 10, you know, and 10,000 in the next five, you, let's say all of them go to zero. Okay, great. You, you may have lost you know, $75,000 or $100,000, depending on which ones go bad. So now you have $500,000 in live money, money that's in companies that are doing really well. They're surging private companies. And the other 20 that you just put little feeler bets, little bets that let you feel out the founder, see what it's like to work with them. Look at their metrics. Are their charts going up and down? Um, are they trending in the right direction? Are they getting great people on their team? So one out of $6 has been burned, but five of $6 is in play. This is the type of strategy that people just don't know. It seems like common sense when I explain it to people, but every single angel investor, every single new one does the same exact stupid mistake they put $100,000 into the first person they meet. And that first person they meet, they don't realize entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs because they are convincing people. Yep. And those convincing people then wind up convincing them to put money in, in a company that the rest of us professionals have passed on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be investing in the companies that the professionals have passed on. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And um, I mean, that goes back to what you started talking about earlier in the show, which was initially when you started investing, it was all about looking at, say, the idea that the entrepreneur had. But anybody who's been in, whether it's uh, investing or entrepreneurship or, say, even corporate innovation long enough, will tell you that it's not about the idea, it's about the execution. And that over time, you will start to identify patterns around what works and what doesn't, particularly when it comes to, say, the founders and what makes a great founder. And I guess we'll, we'll get back to, to that later. But I like what you said there about the portfolio approach. And it aligns with um, some of the stuff we've discussed on the show previously in so far as corporate innovation is concerned, where corporates traditionally, when they're rolling out a new product, you know, they take the waterfall approach. They have a big audacious plan around it. They allocate a huge team, a huge budget, huge schedule. It takes a year or two to go to market, millions of dollars spent, and ultimately product market fit uh, often becomes an afterthought. And oftentimes you have basically what amounts to one big lemon. And so today what we're talking about is with companies who want to start, say, being a little bit more entrepreneurial, it is about placing, say, lots of small bets, like you said, $1,000 here across testing, say, a problem or solution in the early stages, maybe across 10 different ideas. And then as you can get some sort of metrics of success to start validating some of your business model assumptions, maybe you invest an additional $5,000 and then $10,000 into the ones that are showing a bit more promise and drop the other ones. It just seems like, like you said, it's common sense, but oftentimes uh, common sense isn't so common. Yeah, that is the truth, isn't it? You know, if you've gone through uh, what I've gone through, the suffering and pain of the second and third year of angel investing, um, you'll want to avoid it. And what that pain is, is, gee, I put $25,000 into 10 companies and eight of them are dying. Yeah. Oh my God, 200,000 of $250,000 I invested is gone. There's only 50,000 left in play. Uh, 
okay, what do I do with those other eight? You're, you're going to start doing a really bad thing, which is throwing good money after bad. If those first eight companies out of 10 can't raise money from other people, you should not be giving them more money. You should be very clear with them. I'm giving you $25,000 right now or $10,000. You have 10 other people giving you money, so you have a quarter million dollars. When you do the next round, you should have at least half of that round of funding completed from people other than your existing investors. So when a company comes to me and says, we're doing our series A or our series A or seed round plus, you know, or seed plus or our seed plus plus round, they have all different names for it now here in the States. When you come to me for that deal, come to me with, and here are the three new investors. And there's, you know, 60% of the round is done. We have 40% left. Your pro rata is 10% of that. Would you like to go pro rata or super pro rata? In other words, would you like to maintain your 1% ownership? Or would you like to get to one and a half or 2% or ownership of the company? These are like virtuous good things to do. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I guess you're looking for signals then. I mean, that's effectively the market signaling that, hey, they like what they're seeing in this startup. And therefore, if they can convince other reputable investors to invest in it or to take part in that round, then it makes stands to reason that perhaps, hey, if they're investing, then we should invest. But if they can't get anyone else to show interest, then perhaps something's up. Absolutely correct. It's called external validation. Here's some other external validation. When you invested, we had $5,000 a month in revenue. It's nine months later, and we now have $75,000 in yeah. revenue. Yeah. Or we were losing $50,000 a month when you invested. Now we're losing $10,000 a month, and we have $40,000 in revenue. It's like, okay, this is trending in the right way. So there's all different signals you can use, but you have to be able to say no to a company that cannot get it done, or that is you know, um, we're a company that is just not, uh, fulfilling their promise and many companies just don't fulfill their promise. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, yeah, it seems to play out more often than not. And I think failure rates, I'm not sure. I think in the States it's something like 90 to 95% of startups tend to fail. And, you know, oftentimes that can be a good thing because, you know, if they're willing to, pick themselves up to learn from that le- failure and keep moving, then chances are after two or three failures, they tend to make it. And um, conscious that we're talking all about uh, the intricacies of investing, I guess I wanted to take it back. And speaking of you know failure or perhaps coming from a place where perhaps you didn't have all the answers, um, going right back to the beginning, Jason, uh, you grew up in Brooklyn back in the, what, the 80s. You would have been a child of the 80s, I imagine. Yeah, born in born in 1970, raised in the late 70s, early 80s in Brooklyn. Fantastic. Um, well, around the time that uh, Run DMC and the like uh, made their way up, although I think they were from the Bronx. But nonetheless, the Beastie Boys are from Beastie Brooklyn. Boys. Yes, awesome. Biggie awesome. Smalls, Jay Z, <laughs> Nas. Fantastic, fantastic. So, being um, from Brooklyn, firstly, Calicanus. Where is that name from? That is a Greek name, and it comes from. Kali and Kamis with Ks, and it means to have done well. Ah, oh, beautiful. Well, how very fitting, how very fitting. So um, on that name, were your parents um, born in Greece? Or were you born in Greece or are you? No, I was born in Brooklyn. We were third generation. Um, actually, I guess fourth generation. My grandparents were born here, but very young. Their parents came from Ireland, Sweden, and Greece. Okay, excellent. And um, I guess uh, having come from that type of background, um, you would have potentially, I guess, grown up in a somewhat diverse part of uh, Brooklyn where, say, socioeconomically, um, it would have been somewhat challenging growing up in Brooklyn, say, in the early 80s, which is quite different to the, um, uh, I suppose, gentrified, you know, Williamsburg-esque Brooklyn of today. 100% correct. When I lived in Brooklyn, we had... uh an issue. If you went to a club in Manhattan, like the Palladium or the Limelight or Roxy or Tunnel, and you had a Brooklyn driver's license, they would hand it back to you and say, no B&T. That stood for no bridge and tunnel. So if you had to get into Manhattan by a bridge or a tunnel, you were not welcome. Now, everybody who lives in Manhattan goes to Brooklyn for the weekend. So it's quite a quite a sea change. I, I grew up in Brooklyn when it was dangerous and authentic and blue collar. 
not hipster. We had no hipsters back then. Zero hipsters. <laughs> you didn't have any uh, Brooklyn Brooklyn lager as well. Uh, Brooklyn, yeah, that Brooklyn beer was coming up, but yeah, not as many beers then. Or the, or the beers that you did have weren't there for fashion purposes. They were just the uh, the blue collar workers down in the docks and that kind of thing. That would be right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I know you've um said that you know growing up you saw your parents fighting about money ninety percent of the time. And I guess I'm keen to understand you know were there any sort of formative experiences um that got you to say pick up and go over to San Francisco and get into the entrepreneurship game? Because I know before you um got into investing, I mean you were uh you founded the Silicon Valley uh, Reporter back in the late nineties, and you know after the dot com bust, I guess, in in year 2000, you then founded Weblogs. So, I mean, what was, was there any formative experience growing up that forced you to go down this path? Well, where I came from, you really, um, the expectations were pretty low. I think I expected to be a police officer uh, or maybe join the FBI. That was sort of, I think was, I dreamed that would be my career path. Start out get myself into the New York City Police Force and go for a master's in criminology at uh, John Jay and was a college here and then uh, maybe go for the FBI Academy if I did well. What attracted you but to that, it, Jason? I was around a lot of crime and a lot, around a lot of cops when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, when your dad owns a bar, you know, every bar has a drug dealer, a bookie, wise guys, the wise guys who put the cigarette machine in, the wise guys who put the phone in, the wise guys who pick the garbage up. Uh, so, you know, but then you'd also have, you know, the captain of the local police department and a sergeant coming in at three o'clock between lunch and dinner. And I would make them or the chef would make them lunch slash early dinner and I would pour their drinks for them. It was a different era. You know, I would give them a double shot of Bailey's in a cup of coffee and they would have four of them. Uh or I'd give them a Coca-Cola with uh, rum in it. They'd have three or four of those. I mean, these were literally the top police officers in New York City having six, seven, eight drinks on the house. My instructions were to give them a bill, and the bill would be $10 each. Wow. So they could drink and eat whatever they wanted for 10 bucks, And that was, the, and then they would leave me 20 uh, or sometimes you know, more. And uh, we never had problems. Because we took care of them, they took care of us. Mm. So it was, uh, you know, it was an interesting time. I mean, I I look back on it and go, that was insane. But you know, if you live through something insane like that, mm. you generally don't get frazzled later on. Kind of hard for me to get frazzled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I guess um, having lived through that kind of thing, and you know, like you said, it's hard to get frazzled. And you know, you did found the Silicon Valley Reporter, and you know, that went. On, you know, it was initially a little fanzine, but it became a 300 page magazine, media company. You guys are running conferences and all that sort of stuff. And I guess, you know, you kind of fell victim to the dot com boom and everything that happened around the year 2000. I mean, what was it like going through that and managing sort of the, the emotions that would have been involved with something that you built from scratch just coming undone um, so quickly, um, as did so many other companies around that time? Well, you know, I think it either breaks you or it motivates you. And for me, it was depressing in a way, but I was self-aware enough to realize, you know, if I can do this once, I can do it again. And so I've always had that feeling of, you know what, you're going to take some bad beats, you know, in poker, you might have the best hands, your aces can get cracked. You could flop a set and run into a higher set or somebody could go run a runner and hit a flush or a straight. You know, bad things happen to good people. Sometimes your the odds are, you know, like Hillary Clinton had a you know eighty percent chance of winning, and Donald Trump had a twenty, and Donald Trump won. People forget a fifteen or a ten or a twenty percent chance is still a very significant chance. It means you know every time you roll the dice, one out of ten times or one out of five times, uh, you wind up winning. So uh, you have to be able to disconnect yourself from the actual there's a really fine balance you have to be able to disconnect yourself from failure and not take it so personally that it uh doesn't it keeps you from going on to the next big thing in your life and then conversely you can't be so oblivious to your failure that you don't take it um you know if you're so if you're so disconnected from it you 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 know that's a problem too right 
Yeah, well, that's that's um, one of those things where you've pumped so much, say, money or time into something and it may not be working. You know, the whole sunk cost fallacy where you just keep working because you've just invested so much emotion and um, sweat equity into something versus saying, okay, this isn't working. Here are the lessons. I'm going to dust myself off and pick myself up and go again. And I love what you said earlier about um, it either makes you or it breaks you. And obviously, there's so much conventional wisdom out there that says, you know, resilience is a key attribute to look for in entrepreneurs um, because if they are truly doing something new and breakthrough, they're going to face a lot of adversity. They're going to face a lot of untested assumptions. They're going to face a lot of rejection and they're just going to have to keep moving forward. And I guess it is a delicate balance. But um, I mean, aside from resilience, what do you look for in the entrepreneurs that you back, Jason? That's a great question. Um, I have a series of things. And in the book, I go through what to look for and what are tells for people who maybe shouldn't be entrepreneurs right now. So if a per- I'll, I'll give you some of the ones that – I'll start with the ones that will give you an idea that this person is not ready to be a founder of a company. So if a person is unwilling to work on the project until you fund them, they're not an actual real founder. In other words, if they're waiting for your approval, your check to get going on the project, that's a really bad sign. If they won't quit their day job to go pursue this, that is a really bad sign as well. So there's all these bad signs that you can see early on. If you ask them, why are you working on this idea? And you just let them talk. If they don't actually have a very close personal connection to this idea, in other words, I really think that humanity should be multi-planetary and I should have, we should be, you know, living on multiple planets. Well, if, if you don't feel like humanity should be multi-planetary, then, you know, that next day you're going to wake up and be like, well, why the fuck am I working on these rockets? They blew, I blew three of them up in a row and they cost $10 million each. I just burned $30 million. <laughs> like you have to have a real drive. And I've seen this over and over again, you know, when Travis was doing Uber you know, if if Bill de Blasio says in New York City, the mayor of New York City says, you know what, we don't want Uber here anymore. We're going to cap the number of Ubers. You got to wake up that day and say, no, you're not. I'm going to fight you on this and I'm going to fight you tooth and nail. I'm coming out swinging. And that is um, not easy. It's not easy for people to come out swinging like that and fight it. And so when I hear somebody say, I'm doing this for money or I do this because I think Google is going to buy the company. That's just a super, super tell. Now, the next thing is you want people with skills. So I always ask people, what are you good at? What is it? What is your skill? And sometimes people say they don't have a skill. And it's like, really? Well, because, you know, I, I know Travis from Uber and, and he's really a product manager. Um, and uh, he really is good at making products. And, you know, Elon's an engineer at his heart. He likes to engineer things. He understands physics. He's a physicist, engineer, electrical engineer, you know, and uh, the person from Airbnb, you know, is a design person. So you, you don't necessarily have to be one specific skill set, but you should have a skill set. You should be good at something. You know, I'm very I'm a good writer, I, which means I'm a good communicator. I'm good on camera. I can explain complex theories in an entertaining way. I know what I'm good at. I'm also good at being a friend to people. I'm good at being uh, you know, social and speaking in public, all that communication skill. That's what Steve Jobs was good at. He was very good at communicating to people. I'm not comparing myself to Steve Jobs, but we, he was very good at that. And then people might say like, oh, well, he really wasn't very innovative. It's like, well, he didn't need to be because he was so good at packaging stuff. So he had a, he had great design skill and great communication skill. You put those two things together, he could sell, you know, the iPhone three or the iPhone four or the iPhone five, like every time a new iPhone came out, he made it seem drool worthy. Like people were drooling and cheering for him over very minor things. That's a gift. Now, when you talk to somebody and they say, I'm an idea person, guess what? Everybody on the planet is an idea person. You get no, you don't get any credit for being an idea person. There are people who are mentally, uh, stunted, like you could have somebody with a very low IQ who could have a million dollar idea every week. It, being able to come up with a billion idea, a billion dollar idea doesn't take much. Uh, you know, it, it, what, what matters is your ability to execute on it. So 
there's the whole group of reasons of like why not to invest. And in the book, I just advise people, listen, if you're starting out as an angel investor, there's zero reason for you to invest in companies before their products in market and before those products have some traction. Nine out of 10 people emailing you will not have traction yet. Ignore those and just focus on the ones that have traction. Tell the other nine, would love to meet with you, but um, the time for us to meet is when you have more traction. Or you can meet with them and just let them know, let's stay in touch for six months. When you have three, four, five, six months of traction, some sales data, some usage data, that's when I would make my investment decision. And once you become savvy as an angel and you make this kind of stuff clear to people, everything just goes easier. People know I'm looking for products that are in the market that have a little, have modest traction. So I've made it to the market what I'm looking for. People still email me, can I buy you coffee? Can I buy you dinner? It's like, I don't need you to buy me coffee. coffee. Because an hour of your time is worth $4, right? (laughs) Well, it's just also not worth it for them because they could meet somebody who is an investor in pre-product market fit companies. So you want to, you want, everybody needs to be. I look for people also who are, craftsmen and have craftsmanship in their product craft persons in other words people who can make beautiful products and have really good thinking behind them i like people who are fearless and adding new skills and gaining tons of knowledge people who can build good teams and inspire people you know there's there's a bunch of different tells um and so but you know people should develop their own signaling and that signaling will become clear to you as you meet with people as you meet with people it'll become super clear Who's legit and who is not? Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, I love what you said there, particularly in so far as purpose um, is concerned. You know, you're talking about do I really believe in human beings and multiplanetary being a multiplanetary species? If so, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to endure three rocket blasts and eventually get into orbit and all the rest of it and defy pretty much everyone who's telling me I'm in. I'm crazy for doing what I'm doing and basically betting the entire fortune on this dream. But that aligns to so much that, you know, even going back to say the ancient Stoics and guys like Marcus Aurelius would say nothing should be done without purpose. And more recently I interviewed um, Brad Stolberg who wrote a book called Peak Performance in which he interviewed high performing athletes, entrepreneurs, hedge fund managers, all types of stuff. And he basically found that common theme, that purpose was at the center of all of these great people and that he found that purpose was, you know, the world's number one performance enhancer because if you've got that going for you, you're going to have no issues getting up in the morning and giving it 110%. That is 110% true. Mm. And um, I know in your book you cover four founder questions and you've kind of touched on them there. And I mean, the questions real quick, uh, why has this founder chosen this business? How committed is this founder? What are the founder's chances of succeeding in the business and in life? And what does winning look like in terms of revenue and your return? Now, I guess that's looking at it from one founder's perspective. And now I'm, I'm Conscious that some companies out there or, say, investors or accelerator programs are starting to do, say, psychometric testing, which looks at uh, co-founder alignment. How aligned are these co-founders, say, in terms of their attitudes, their values, the way they see the world? Are they going to be effectively working together for a number of years? So, I mean, do you look at something like that when investing in terms of the co-founding team? No, that's... uh... I think that's a little obsessive. Uh, the likely scenario is, you know, if you have two or three founders, you know, it's if you have three founders, one of them might leave early, one of them might overperform, one of them might perform as expected. It's not the end of the world. Sometimes people get cut from the team, they vest their shares. It's not as big a deal. Um, you know, if, if the product gets product market fit and it grows, these things tend to work out. There's enough wealth, there's enough Uh, appreciation of the stock value for everybody to be taken care of sometimes it gets contentious like mark zuckerberg had to like screw over five co-founders you know and he got into lawsuits with them um so you get the idea i think you know people are uh, and then you know you just you know once in a while you'll have the third founder of youtube javid he just didn't want to do it anymore i think he wanted to go back to school so i invested some percentage of his shares and Chad Hurley and Steve Chen, you know, went to work. I'm sure that they didn't like him getting a free ride on whatever percentage of shares, but you know, he did, and that's that. And uh, I'm trying to think of other examples. Evan Spiegel and his partner, they let go of the third founder who may or may not have been a founder. These things are, 
usually easy to settle. Um, it's better to not have to deal with it. But that's why we have a vesting schedule as a requirement when you take money. Everybody who takes money has to vest. There has to be a one-year cliff so you don't put in three months and get that first year or you don't have dead money on the cap table. And then if there is dead money on the cap table, you know, before you raise the next round of funding, you can just go to all that dead money and say, you have to sell your shares or you're going to be diluted you know, massively, so you might as well sell them now or we'll buy half of them from you and you take the other half, it's a free ride. Or more shares are going to be issued to the founding team now. And so, you know, and that's all fair. Um, so. No, that makes sense. And I guess, yeah, you'd rather take that approach than overanalyze. And it is about being flexible to change. And, you know, if I, if I relate this back to, say, the world of music, you know, we've got bands out there like ACDC and Van Halen who endured changing, you know, lead singers like Bon Scott and David Lee Roth and still went on to sell multi-platinum um, selling albums. So it's no different than startup will. You just need to be able to ride the waves and the uncertainty that comes your way. And the fact is that different people go down different journeys and there will be change um, at the helm of a startup over time um, in many cases. So totally makes sense. And I imagine you've taken a board seat with a number of your investments, Jason? Once in a while, if I feel massive conviction or it's a friend of mine, I will do that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I guess um, I wanted to explore something that um, Ed Cutmel puts forward in um, Creativity Inc. when he talks about Pixar Animation Studio and how they have this process called a brain trust where people come together to just give each other really wildly honest feedback about a film without fear of recourse, with no fear of hurting other people's feelings and all that type of stuff. Um, do you have a process in place when it comes to, say, providing that feedback to startups in a way that is, say, constructive and or... I guess, yeah, I'm keen, keen to understand what that might look like. If you have me as, as an investor, you've elected to um, have a candid relationship. It's that simple. So, you know, you're not, you're not having me as an investor unless you're, you really want me to be candid. That's that simple. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think it's, uh, you know, I don't need to have a construct, but Ed Catmull's book, I had him on my podcast, Creativity Inc. is a fantastic book. And I think being candid is something people, you know, we all need a little bit more of in life. It's nice to have people tell you like, hey, it's not personal, but you could be doing a better job at these things. Yeah. And I guess that's probably something you also look for in your um, investments in terms of the entrepreneurs themselves being, uh, you know, open to that criticism and constantly learning rather than being wedded to to their ideas. I mean, flexibility is key with any startup, especially during those early formative stages, which is where most of your investments are. The fact is that they're going to go through a lot of change and evolution. And unless they're willing to listen to, say, investors, partners, customers, particularly, they're probably not going to make the changes they need to to find that product market fit. Yeah, you want a founder who has the strength to stay focused on what matters and they want to have a strong opinion. And then you also want to have they're, them to have the ability to listen. Yeah, makes sense. And um, back at the start of the show, we we're talking about uh, alchemy and how it's a little bit of science plus other. And I guess that triggered my thinking because I've spoken with guys like um, Sean Ellis from growthhackers.com and Ben Yoskovitz who wrote The One Metric That Matters and, and the book Lean Analytics. And they always talk about, you know, you've got to have quantitative and qualitative data but that also gets paired with, say, a healthy dose of gut or professional judgment. Um, have you found that to be more or less the, the case when it comes to investing? That, hey, you do have a lot, a lot of hard attributes you look for, but a lot of it just comes with time and, say, that pattern recognition that we were alluding to earlier. Pattern recognition is a very important aspect to all of this. You're going to want to develop your own different, you know, different, different signaling matters in different time spans of a company, different signaling matters in different verticals. So what might apply to biotech companies might not apply to business to consumer. The founder of an enterprise software company might need different qualities than the founder of a media company or a food startup or any operationally heavy service company. So yeah, sure, you'll get signaling. I think the important thing is to get in the game make small bets and learn and not to take a, and you got to take a 10 year view of this. I think if people read the book angel, they, they sometimes when they pick it up, they immediately go, Oh, this is a self-help book that will help me get rich overnight. And then they read it and they go, Oh no, this is a philosophy for life. 
of how to focus on what matters to create massive value. And you can participate in any number of ways, being the founder of a company, an employee of the company, a consultant to companies, or being an investor in the companies. And so, you know, um, if you listen or read the book, I, 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 I actually do the narration of the book. So if you had, like my voice during this conversation, get the, get the audible. If you, if you don't like my voice, then get the Kindle or the hardcover. But um, I think it's books are just so wonderful at conveying a lot of information at a very cheap price. When you think about it, it's 20 bucks for a book and it's got 200 pages, you know, 288 pages. So it's like this crazy, like, whatever that winds up being for a page, but a penny a page, something, you know, 10 cents a page. Yeah. And this is the thing, like so many people I speak to, we deal with a lot of early stage entrepreneurs come through our space in, in Melbourne and, um, they often say, Oh, how can I find a mentor? Like we can, we can hit them up with people, but ultimately, you know, read books. There's so much value just packed into these books. And like you said, $20, a penny a page, that's not just your yeah. business card. That's a lot of insights that you've collected from years of being in this game. And that's that's a form of mentorship. I mean, that's standing on the shoulders of giants. And I, I mean, it's just the easiest way to kind of get from A to B without having to learn the hard lessons that others have learned before you. I, uh, I listen to two or three books, typically audio books per month. And uh, on top of that, I uh, listen to a podcast a day. So I, uh, I'm constantly trying to, you know, increase my own knowledge base. Um, and it's uh, so far so good. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's no excuse um, not to uh, be cr increasing your knowledge base today, particularly when access to media has been democratized um, in the way it has been. Um, so I wanted to touch up, uh, close off on a couple of other points. So um, Jason, we work with a lot of corporates here in terms of their innovation programs. And now what we're seeing is massive amounts of capital being thrown into CVCs or corporate venture capital. So in 2016, it was something like $127 billion globally. Um, a large percentage of this was in early stage startups. And I guess corporates might see this as an opportunity to you know, offset some of the threat of tech disruption because most corporates are big and slow moving and perhaps struggling to navigate the uncertainty that's coming their way, whereas startups are built to be a lot more nimble, um, are built to experiment, are built to try new things and try and find product market fit in new markets. So, um, I mean, what are your views of corporates partnering with startups and or do you have any advice as insofar as that early stage investment for them is concerned? Is it as simple as picking up a copy of your book or are there other things they should be looking for, such as synergies between, say, their corporate strategy and their corporate assets? I would say corporate VC is great for the ecosystem because those companies, if managed correctly, can be they can they can be quite material to a company. So I love corporate VCs. I know some traditional VCs don't like them because they think, oh, they're going to interfere or they might be stealing ideas or something. Uh, I don't mind that. You can put little things in place where, you know, they have to step out of the room if they're on the board or not giving them board seats. And then for people who are in corporate venture capital, you know, they, they really have a dual mandate. One is to uh, be an early warning educational system for the company. And the second is to make a return. And, their return, and the third thing is their return profile is if we get our money back or we double our money, we're happy. So, and if we lose half our money, we don't care. So for them, it's like we're getting this incredible education and boom. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And um, finally, there's been a lot of talk, Jason, recently about uh, ICOs, cryptocurrencies, Ethereum, Bitcoin, blockchain, all that sort of stuff. And I guess, what are your thoughts on the initial coin offerings being, say, a threat to the traditional venture capital landscape? It's not. So until it is, it's not. And uh, I'm not too worried about it. I mean, I think there will be, you know, the, the ICOs, 99 out of 100 of them or some very high percentage are essentially bad ideas that are being funded with large amounts of money before they even get to market. So you know how I went this whole thesis about, you know, investing companies that have their products in market. We now have a bunch of idiots who are Bitcoin rich or Ethereum rich from around the world plowing money into ICOs 
for products that are not even launched yet. And so too much money can send a company way off course and you don't want to do that. So I think it's the ICOs are huge scams in most cases or they're overfunded in some cases. Uh, you know, you'll find one or two like Vinny Lingham's is uh, an interesting one. He's working in identity. He's an entrepreneur who's, you know, raised money before. So I, the way I look at it is if you look at all these entrepreneurs, have they sold a company for more money than they raised in their ICO before. And I think you'll find that like, you know, for these people raising 20 or 50 or $100 million in their ICO, they have not actually produced a company before that sold for that amount. And so it's very dangerous. I would, if my parents asked me if they should do it, I would say, no, definitely not. Where if you do do it, put less than 1% of your net worth in it and could kiss it goodbye because it's probably not going to work out. Now, blockchain, cryptocurrency, all that stuff is very real. It's very real technology. It's going to have a profound impact. And I think it's how venture funds will manage liquidity in the future. In other words, it's a very good chance for people to say, hey, I am going to uh, allow the people in my fund to trade shares. So if I have 50 LPs in my fund and one of them wants to liquidate for whatever personal reasons, they could go to the other 49 and say, I'm liquidating my 2% position. Would anybody like to buy it? Make an offer. I'm going to sell it. There's an auction. It gets sold. And then you're all done. Perfect. No, no harm, no foul. Yeah. As opposed to your traditional sort of, um, say, venture capital model where your funds may be locked up for X number of years and obviously it's nowhere near as liquid as being able to just exchange um, your equity on a secondary market. That's exactly right. And there isn't a very fluid secondary market. So these transactions theoretically could be going on um, independent of, you know, anything else. Yeah, excellent. And uh, yeah, you're right about the uh, the ICOs in terms of uh, – you know, t tracing that back to your investment philosophy, which is show me the thing that you've made. In, as far as uh, raising funds on a uh, raising a coin offering is concerned, it's all about creating a white paper, and that's basically all you need to produce. So if you're really good at putting white papers together and getting creative in um, uh, some sort of design platform or Photoshop or PowerPoint or whatever you use, then hey, maybe you can raise some funds on an ICO, but doesn't mean you'll be successful. So um, thanks again. Jason, for giving up some time to talk to the audience of Future Squared, you've given them a wealth of knowledge. If people want to learn more, they should definitely check out a copy of the book, and we'll add that to the show notes for our listeners. But before we go, we've got to throw you into our three-question lightning round, Jace. Are you ready to rock and roll? I'm ready. Lightning round, go. Lightning round, go. Okay, question number one. If you could work for any company at any stage of the company lifecycle, who would it be and why? Um, I think working for um, uh, that's a great question. I mean, for me, it might have been um, working for Columbia Records when they signed Bob Dylan. Um, that would have been an interesting moment in time. So it's an interesting um, answer. Usually, we get people talking about, say, you, you know. As far you know, I guess it's people's tendencies to focus on the short now. So they'll say, "Oh, Google in the mid '90s, or Apple in the early '80s and late '70s." But no, I like, I like the uh, the music twist on things there. Very cool, very cool. Question number two is: If you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be, and what would you ask? Wow, that's a great question. I'm thinking about massively uh, massive historical figures. God, who are the masterly historical figures I would like to ask a question to? I'm thinking of like people who did bad things in the world. Like maybe if I asked Hitler, like, you know, why are you doing this? And is this really necessary or something to that effect? Like maybe you could have some in positive impact on them or change their approach to the world. But talking to Jesus Christ about why he was uh, willing to allow them to crucify him and uh, instead of running, that would be a pretty darn good question too. So I'm going to go with my Jesus. I'm going to go with Jesus. I like it. I, I like it. Jesus, why he didn't go on the lamb. Yep. I would have definitely uh, turned turned and started running uh, as quickly as possible. So um, the last question, Jason, is, I mean, you've done quite, we've done very well, obviously, in the last um, 
six or well, last eight years of investing, but prior to that, obviously, you uh, built and sold weblogs to AOL for about 25 to 30 million, somewhere in that ballpark, as my research incorrect. suggests. <laughs> yeah, your research is not incorrect. And I guess I'm just curious to understand what sort of um, rituals or routines you might have um, that you partake in on a daily basis to keep you firing on all cylinders. Well, I um, I like to take long walks. I like to read. I like to spend time with my kids. So um, those kind of things uh, really help me get some balance. I like to go see my friends and play poker with them and talk about the world. And then I like to hang out with my team, you know, and just, you know, laugh. And we have a weekly lunch where we kind of goof off and just talk about what's going on. So, you know, I like the social aspects when we have a little downtime, but we're still talking about business in the future. Um, and so I like to mix a little bit of that. I, I think people get a little rigid about what's work and what's not work. Like I play poker with a bunch of people from the industry. We're not working, but you know, sometimes the topic of work comes up. Sometimes the talk of, topic of basketball or Donald Trump comes up. But I think playing games and, and you know, having your brain engaged in some flow activities is always a good idea. Yeah, definitely. And um, I think it's a common theme between a lot of our guests, which is get outside, get into nature and just engage in your community, whether that's family, friends or your extended circle of associates. So um, awesome stuff. Yeah, correct. All right. I'll see you in Sydney. I'm going to be in Sydney in next June and the June after that for Launch Festival Sydney. Fantastic. Well, I'll make plans to uh, be in town and maybe we can grab a coffee. And I guess if Absolutely. the audience want to pick up a copy of the book, they can do so on Amazon. They can also find sure. out more at angelthebook.com. They can hit you up on Twitter at Jason, which is a fucking yep. awesome Twitter handle, by the way. Okay. And if they want to get $1,000 off their Tesla and get free supercharging, they can use the code Jason29 to do that. Thank you. Yes. I'm trying <laughs> to start my friend Elon, sell a couple of cars. Awesome. All right. Thanks, I'll talk Jason. To you soon. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Hey guys, it's Steve again. If you're picking up what we're putting down, we'd love it if you took just a minute of your time to like, share, or subscribe to Future Squared on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. It would mean a hell of a lot to the team here who work effortlessly to bring you thought leaders and experts on topics of corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-improvement on a weekly basis. As always, you can find more resources on innovation, including blogs, books, podcasts, videos, webinars, and tools at www.collectivecamp.us. If you'd like to connect with me on Twitter, you can do so at Steve Golovesky. That's G-L-A-V-E-S-K-I. Until next time, keep innovating. Future Squared out.